You're listening to sermon audio from Ankeny Free Church in Ankeny, Iowa. Our mission is to trust and follow Jesus and to help others to do the same. Join us now as we dive back into our sermon series in the book of Acts, to the ends of the earth. Father, we ask that in this time you would speak to us, that we would begin to have a new and fresh hope that's grounded and founded in you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would, you would speak to us. You would use my words or work in spite of what I might say, but Lord, we want to hear from you. We ask that your spirit would work in us and would use your word to form us so that we might look ever more like your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So a brief overview here. Let me give you a little key. If you want to find out what a book of the Bible is kind of about, kind of a big idea for the entire book, one great strategy is to do what we call the, the head and the tail, to look at the first and the beginning. And so here in the book of Acts, we start out with this promise of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus began to do, so implying that there's going to be something more than for to be done here in this world. And it ends with Paul now having some new freedom in Rome, beginning to preach about the kingdom of God and the gospel with boldness and the word of God continuing to spread. And so we see that that's really what the book of Acts is about. Now, if you were observant while we read, he says, in the first book. Well, what, what other book are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And it's worth turning to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to complete a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you might have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So he's writing here an orderly account. Now, it's called the Gospel of Luke because Luke wrote it, but Luke doesn't say that he wrote it, not in so many words. The reason we know that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke is because in the book of Acts, chapter 16, we see a change. The author of the book of Acts was saying, they did this and they did that. And then suddenly in Acts 16, as Paul and his group were prohibited from going up to Bithynia, they began to sail to Troas. It's not they sailed to Troas, but we sailed to Troas. Someone joined them, and we know that person is Luke. The text tells us that Luke joined them and was with them for a while. And so that's how we know that Luke wrote this. Now, the Gospel of Luke has a particular edge to it, as all the Gospels do. Every one of the Gospels answers the question, who is Jesus? And that's the primary thing they want to show, is who is Jesus? But each Gospel tends to have a special emphasis and in the Gospel of Luke, it is this. And this is the key verse for the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the key verse, I believe, for the book of Luke. And we see that in various places. Luke is always highlighting these people that seem far from God, and yet Jesus is, is honing in, giving them his special attention. It's only in the book of Luke that we have Luke 15, where we hear about the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, or as some of you may know it, the prodigal son. And so Luke emphasizes Jesus reaching out to those that might seem far from God to us, but they aren't out of the sight of our Lord and Savior. Now, the book of Luke does conclude here in Luke chapter 24 with some of the things that Jesus was teaching them. He says this in Luke 24, 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's referring here to the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus. 
Verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Now, this promise is the Holy Spirit. And so here, as he ends his first book and begins his second book, he creates a close tie saying um, a lot of the same things that he said in the one and the other, showing this connection. And so now here we are in Acts 1, waiting for this promise here of the Holy Spirit. And, And we're waiting to see what God is going to do with this small group of people as Jesus is spending his last days there about to ascend to the Father. Now, before we jump in on how this applies to us, I want to hone in on one particular issue. It says here in verse 5, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Uh, Baptism of the Holy Spirit is what happens when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we see this in various places. We see this in Ephesians 1.13, where having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. We, we see that in uh, Ephesians 5.16, that believers are to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, that this is something that is to be ongoing in our lives. We see the work of the Spirit, um, again, when we believe in places like Titus 3.5. He saved us, not by deeds done in righteousness, but by His great mercy, by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Time and time again, um, Paul talks about our identity in Christ as being that which has been baptized or united by the Spirit in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, why am I saying all of this? Well, there is a doctrine that came about a little over 100 years ago that said that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a distinct event from salvation. That there is this, you're this Christian, but then you you get baptized in the Spirit, and then you're kind of a, a, a more than that Christian. And the reason that I highlight it here is because you see the, the places that people go to in the book of Acts, because it, it's nowhere else in the New Testament. It's only in the book of Acts that you would find um, this kind of indication that something like this might happen. Now, let me explain, though, what's going on. In the book of Acts, as I said, it's divided into three sections, the Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. And there are three places where we see um, great expressions of the Holy Spirit that that happened, showing that indeed the Holy Spirit has come and dwelt his people. Uh, The first is in Acts chapter 2. It's going to happen here pretty soon. And uh, that happens right at the moment of salvation. The next two, however, um, are in Acts chapter 8 and then Acts chapter 19. And and this occurs in Acts chapter 8 with Samaritans. These would have been people that weren't Jewish but have a Hebrew background. Um, But the Jewish people would have considered them as unclean as they've rejected God by by doing whatever and are not a part of God's promised people. And so when we see the Spirit fall on them there, it's significant. And it has to happen, and it does happen, um, with the witness of the apostles. And so we see that, that the apostles come to witness this event. That's the same thing that happens in um, Acts chapter 19, but this time with the Gentiles, with the rest of the nations. And so if we tie that in to the the heart Luke sees in Jesus for reaching those that are far from him, in the book of Acts, there is no question that the gospel of God is for the Jewish people. It's for Samaritans. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. Time and time and time again. In fact, when we get to chapter 10, we're going to hear the same long story twice just so we remember that that no one is outside the saving grace of God. There's not a people group that is like, "Mm, you, you cannot be saved. We see that right here in the book of Acts. Now, I will say this. Um, There are events 
in many people's lives where you've been a Christian for a long time and God gets a hold of your life and you get on fire for the Lord. And, and this, is, this is a new thing and this is a new work that God is doing in you. You've never, you've never been that passionate for the Lord. You've never been that excited for the Lord. And it can feel like, boy, I'm just, I'm getting saved. Something new has happened. And this has happened uh, throughout Christendom. We call them revivals. People have been revived in their faith, been, been excited. There's something that's been awakened that wasn't quite there before. Or even someone like a Jared Wilson would say this is gospel wakefulness. And I am excited for that. I embrace that. I want that. I just, it's not called baptism of the Spirit. <laughs> not to belabor a long point, but I know many have been kind of wounded by that kind of distinction. God's Spirit can do some amazing things in us, but we get it at the moment of salvation. All right, let's, now to the message, right? <laughs> I want to give you hope. I think this passage wants to give you hope. I think this, this passage wants to give you hope, uh, not just in, in things that we can take, but hope really that's grounded in God's spirit. You see, when we look at the life of Jesus, the Holy Spirit led Jesus, that, that same spirit one person of the triune God. That's the very spirit that indwells us and that works in us. And I think our passage here gives us three reasons why we should have a ton of hope. First, we have a lot of hope because God gives us what we need. God gives us what we need. It's what he gives these lost and struggling disciples. He gives them what they need. Look at what he gives them. He promises the Holy Spirit, not just the Spirit, but He gives them the Spirit in order to guide them in the Word of God. Now, it's not as clear here. We look back at the book of Luke where it's crystal clear as Jesus is saying the Old Testament is pointing to me and, and the, this new Spirit is going to give you illumination as you read the Word. But when we look at the New Testament, what the New Testament is and can only be is the testimony of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 tells us this. In many times, in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so we should expect then no additional revelation in these last days except that which is by his son. There's no additional scripture. And what we see in the New Testament those individuals that had interaction with Jesus and are bearing testimony to that. That's why we don't have, you know, every century or so, a little addition to our Bibles that's being inserted in, some people saying some new things. It's because it ended with this testimony about Jesus. And not just, you know, necessarily all the, the things about Jesus, but specifically his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and the sending of the Spirit. And that's what we got here. We see that. We, we talk about what Jesus began to do and teach. We, we give um, insight into the commands through the Holy Spirit, whom he had chosen. He, he presented them alive, suffering after many proofs to them of his suffering, and talked to them about the kingdom of God. One of the oldest of creeds or, or sayings I think we have is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, Paul is sharing with them something that it seems like they say to themselves a lot. He says, I, I brought the gospel to you in verse 1. And then, then he, says, he says this, For I delivered to you what was of first importance, what I have also received, that is, Christ died according to the Scriptures, was buried, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and then appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then to the five hundred, and on and on. This is the center of what we believe. This is the center of what we hold dear, and this is the center of what God has revealed to us. And when we look at the New Testament, all it really is is implications of that very fact of what Christ came to do. And we're given that. We're given that. Not only given that, we're given the Spirit to guide us in that. 
God has given us what we need. He's, he's given us his spirit. He's given us his word. But he's also given us his people. Guess what? Part of God's provision are the people you're sitting around right now. And you may be going, oh, wah, wah. No. <laughs> but that's just because you haven't spent enough time. You, 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 don't, you don't know uh, the richness of God's people, of God's work through others and how he can work through you. And that's why we work very, very hard to connect you guys together. That's why we spend time together. It's why we do uh, community groups. It's why I, I want people that don't know Jesus, they, they get introduced to Jesus by, by people that know Jesus. Uh, God uses his people. And and we're here. We're here together. He didn't preach all of this to 120 individuals in the privacy of their own individual homes. They were together because they were going to go forward together. And they were going to form communities that would gather people together. And, and they, would, they, they would call them out and bring them as, as one. And that's a good gift for us. He's given us everything we need. Anyone here like Legos? Don't be afraid. I love Legos. There came a point in my life where I said, I'm a grown man, I can't be buying more Legos. But then I had kids. And so that was fantastic. I love them, love them, love them. One thing I've, exp I've bought, I mean thousands of dollars worth of Legos, I'm sure. Well, not me, my parents. I should, my mom probably has a running bill. <laughs> One thing I have witnessed my entire time is if you buy a Lego set, you have all the pieces you need. Some of you may say, oh, but I have this. And I'd ask you a few questions. One, is it really Lego? Because if it's not Lego, you know, it's all up in the air. Two, have you checked the vents and the drains? And I want to see that thing. I remember one time I was working with my nephew and he was like, hey, we lost a piece. There's not, a, we're missing a piece. This Lego brand thing, we've lost a piece. I'm like, I've never seen that happen. And so I was like, I bet, I bet. So we tore it all apart. And sure enough, put the wrong piece somewhere in the middle. Didn't do it quite right. Got every piece. It made, you know, I look at this and when you're scrounging around for a piece and you think, they've failed me. It's failed me. They, they're missing a piece. It's going to be incomplete. My experience is it's never happened. It's never happened. Now, as reliable as Lego may be, the Lord our God is way more reliable. He's given you everything you need. He's given you everything you need. He is better than Lego brand company in giving you what you need. And we can take hope and hope when God sends the Spirit into our lives that he's given us everything we need to. The second reason why we have hope is because, well, <laughs> you know, uh, God has called you for this moment. God has called you for this moment. Look here in verse 1. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. The implication here is this, is there's additional stuff. Now, Jesus' work on the cross is finished. When he declared it, it was done, completed for all time forever. There, there is nothing more to add to salvation than what Jesus has done. However, there is a mission that Jesus and the Spirit is sending us on, and that is that that gospel good news would go out to a world that needs it. I have a confession. I'm, I'm not the, you know, I like sports, but I know I'm not the biggest sports fan. But suddenly I find myself extraordinarily, extraordinarily interested in the WNBA. Anyone else kind of like, oh my goodness, like I didn't think... I never would have thought, but, so, you know, sure enough, I type, you know, ESPN and Ari has it out to WNBA. I'm like, oh, that's, enough is enough, right? And so I, if you're not familiar, the WNBA has a player called Caitlin Clark. And 
she has some loose connections to Iowa. I'm not really sure about all that. And she scores some points and passes the ball. And it's like a big deal. I don't know. If, you're, if you know a little bit more, you can share more. But at any rate, I'm super interested in all that. And you see these records being broken. And there's this drama that's building up. This is my first year of being engaged, really, with the WNBA. But it's not the first year for the WNBA. It's been around for a while. People have been playing basketball for decades. I, there's previous records. There's, there's people, women and men, that, that have played you know, for a long time. And, and so it's not like they're just new on the scene. But this year is their year. All the points that are going to be scored, all the assists, all the rebounds for this season are going to occur from players that are playing this season. This is their season to do that. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know why I came for such great insight. Of course that's true. That's just how things work. That's how it works with us. I think oftentimes we feel like, has, has God called me to do anything? I, I, should, I belong in a different place in a different time. I, I, I'm, I'm not able mm -mm, for, for this world and what he has for me. Well, guess what? He, he's called you to this time. He's called you to this place. And just like back then, he called those people to this time and to this place. God worked through them back then. And he's been working through people for the, for the 2,000 years up to this point that is now our time. This is the team. This is the team. And he's called you to be a part of this. And it should give us great hope and encouragement. And you think, well, I don't know. I don't feel equipped. I don't feel whatever, I don't know if I feel up to it. You're on the team. God doesn't make mistakes. He's, he knows what he's doing. He didn't put you at a different time. He didn't put you in a different place. He didn't put you in, in a different area. He put you here and now, together with us. And there's lots of collections of people just like us that are also called to this time and also called to this place. And so we want to be faithful at this time. But also we have hope. We have hope that it's, it's not a mistake. This moment is our moment. If God is going to be glorified through his people, that means us, not someone else. It's us. It's us. This is our season. And this is our time. And you might not feel like it. You might not think that oh, I'm up to the task. That's great. I mean, it's the Spirit working through us. But, but this is our time. And we can take great hope that God didn't make a mistake and that when he wants to move through people, that includes you and I. You and I. And then last, the last reason we have hope is because God loves us. God loves us. Now, bear with me as I kind of show this from this passage. <laughs> It's interesting that this book is written to a guy, to, to this O. Theophilus, right? We don't, we don't know who Theophilus is. We don't know if it's a person. We don't know if it's a nickname for somebody. We don't know if it's just a description for anyone that would read this. You see, the word Theophilus means one who loves God. One who loves God. And it just reminds us that Luke went to all this effort <laughs> for this person that's called one who loves God, and all Luke talks about is not you need to love God, but how much God loves you. What we see in the book of Luke, we see in the book of Acts. Have you experienced God's love? If the answer is yes, it's because of the Holy Spirit, if you've truly experienced it. Romans 5.5 5 tells us that God pours his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God's love comes to us, if I could be plain, through Jesus Christ. 
And when we trust in Christ, we receive the Spirit. And, and, when we, and, and time and time again, we, we see this throughout the pages of Scripture, and we'll see this in the pages of Acts about God's, God's great love, his great rescue for his people, his great redemption that's a, occurring here in this world that includes those of us that trust in the Lord Jesus. And that gives us great hope that, that God didn't just fix problems. He sent himself not only Jesus into this world, but his very spirit to our lives right now. And the foremost reason is because of his great love. And it's interesting, if you are a lover of God, it's not because, you know, <laughs> you're a great person. It's because of 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. And we're just reminded time and time again that it is God who is love. It is God that is the giver of love. It is God that is the originator of love. It is God through his love that gave us both uh, God the Son and God the Spirit. It is God's Spirit now that we receive the, the love from the Father. So if you feel like, boy, I need some love, we need to look to the Lord. He gets poured into our heart through his Spirit. And so we have hope. We're not unloved, but we're deeply loved because of what God has done through us through Jesus Christ. We're going to remember that now, and it's going to take a little bit, but I, I think we'll be okay. I want us to take a time where we spend time with the Lord's Supper. This is an opportunity for those who trust in the Lord Jesus, and what we're going to do is we're going to have you come forward. I'll explain here in a minute. But if you don't trust the Lord Jesus, if you're just here on a Labor Day weekend and, and this doesn't describe you, we are so glad you are here. And we, you know, we invite you to just kind of sit and ponder. We don't want you to do something that you don't mean. Um, but this is a remembrance for those that have trusted in the body and the blood of Jesus as the hope for their salvation. And if that describes you, um, we, we look forward to this time. Well, what we do here, and you guys can kind of figure it out, is somewhere here, part of you go this way, part of you go that way, and then you guys come here, and then you guys come here, and we'll form um, a bit of a line. Not everyone has to stand up at the same time. And we'll do groups of like three to six at a time. You'll be handed the bread, and then one of the elders will say something, and you take the bread, and then you'll be handed the cup. One of the elders will say something, and you take the cup together. You drop your cup off in the trash right there, and then you make your way back to your seat. And so um, that's how we'll do this at this time. I want to share here the words of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 11 says this, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you, proclaim, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. And we just ask that you would work in our hearts, that we might remember not, not only your, your purpose for us, not only your provision for us, but, Lord, your great love for us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can remember how you came after us, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, waiting and looking, longing for our return. Lord, we thank you for your great love when, when, we, when we were resistant and how you've changed our heart and given us your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you are blessed and encouraged by this week's message, and we invite you to join us every Sunday morning, in person or online, for morning worship. Have questions about what it means to know and follow Jesus? Simply email Todd at AnkenyFree.Church. Thanks for listening.